Hearing none, I'll declare nominations closed and entertain a motion that the clerk cast one ballot for Cindy Davis for treasurer for the upcoming year. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of the clerk casting one ballot for Cynthia Davis to serve as your treasurer from July 1st, 2014 to June 30th, 2015, please say aye. Aye. And opposed, no. And it's carried. Thank you. Article 4, to see what salaries and or allowances the district will pay to its officers, directors, and treasurer. <coughs> What is the current uh, what is the current pay? I think it's uh, four hundred for members. Five hundred for the chair and five hundred for treasurer, right? That's okay. So it's it's five hundred for the board chair, four hundred for the members, and five hundred for the treasurer. What is your pleasure? So moved. Some it's been moved that we do pay the uh, board chair 500, members 400, and the treasurer 500 for the year. Is there a second to that? It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed, no. And it's carried. Article number five is to set the date of the annual meeting of the district for the first Tuesday of February in the year of 2015. What is that date? Maybe we don't have to do that. It says the first Tuesday. So yeah. we say the first Tuesday. After first Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. inside oh. joke, right? <laughs> February 3rd. Yep. February 3rd. I believe that date is February 3rd. Can I have a motion to that effect? So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and seconded to set the, that the date of the annual meeting of the district for the first Tuesday, which is the 3rd of February in the year 2015. Any discussion on that article? If not, all those in favor, please say aye. And those opposed, no. And it's carried. Article number six is to conduct a public informational hearing on the 2014-2015 Leone Gray Union High School District number 34 budget, which is to be established on February 5th, 2014, by Australian ballot on the following ballot question. Shall the Leland Gray Union High School District adopt a budget of six million nine hundred ninety-nine thousand three hundred eighteen dollars to defray its expenses and liabilities for the 2014-2015 school year? Do you want to open it up, Emily, or do you want to just ask for? Do you want to give something first before um, we ask the questions? Sure, we'd be happy to speak. The board itself yeah. would be happy okay. to speak. To maybe, maybe if we could like start at the end and introduce her. Right. Stephen, that was Stephen. Excuse me. I'm uh, Dr. Stephen John. I'm the superintendent of schools. And uh, welcome. I appreciate you all coming out tonight. Don't forget to uh, get out to vote. Uh, weather permitting tomorrow, uh, try to prevail against the snow. I don't know whether it's going to be a snow day. Don't start any rumors. But uh, I'll be getting up early to check out the weather. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dorit Dorfman. I'm the principal of Gray. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, Jeremy Kellaway, the young great board member from New Paint. Colin Medavi from New Paint. Paul Jervis, board member from Townsend. Joe Enrich, also from Townsend. Mike Dolan, also from Townsend. <clears throat> Emily Long, New Paint. Dion Newton Windham. Abby Dixon, Jamaica. Bruce Parliament, Jamaica. And Lindell Paul Brookline. I'm Frank Rucker, the financial officer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll just. First of all, I just want to say that <laughs> I barely just got back into the state. I've been um, down at the, our nation's capital for the last few days attending a, a conference for school boards, um, National School Boards Association. And um, 
it's been a quite a quite an interesting few days down there, and um, it's going to be an interesting few months, I think, coming up in our own state house here. There's an awful lot going on in education, and not only the country, but in our our um, state. But we're here in front of you today to talk about the Leland Gray budget. And um, our proposed budget is $6,999,318. Um, and that translates into a 2.8% increase in spending over last year's uh, budget. Uh, as, as we've done in the last several years, I think we stood in front of you for quite a number of years and told you that um, we're focusing, our budget is focused, focused on the needs of our students. And so that's what we're um, that's what we're presenting for you tonight. Um, but we're also trying to do meet the needs of the students with the least impact on the taxpayers that we can um, do. But that being said, our students and their education remained our uh, top priority. So that's that's been part of this. This this is a really great board. We have been really focused on um, trying to increase opportunities and keep spending down and there's been a lot of support we've got great leadership and administration in the school and in rsu and so we're moving forward i i, I think um instead of going through specific lines in the budget although um board members are ready to share anything you would like them to share we're also here to answer questions for you um i just wanted to say one thing that happened to me down in, uh, before, before we open it up for questions, I just wanted to say one thing that happened to me down in D.C. Um, I, I actually was fortunate enough to attend a speech by Dr. Bernice King, who is Martin Luther King's daughter. And she said something that kind of struck me. Uh, she said, public education was and still is a civil rights issue. And, and I thought that was interesting, and I, I knew there was something that rang in my, my mind somewhere about where I'd heard that before, and I went back to some notes, and, and in December I heard um, our new Secretary of Education, uh, Rebecca Holcomb, and she said something very similar. She said, public schools are the civil rights issue of our times. In fact, I think they're both right, and, and um, we're here to bring a budget to you that we feel is, is necessary to meet the needs of our students for a world-class education in this 21st century. So we'd like to open it up for you and see what, unless somebody else wants to share something first. Okay. We're here to answer questions. Anybody have any questions for the board, for the principal, superintendent, finance? Yes. I just I just want to know more about under uh, support services on the summary page, 25 percent increase. If that was just taken, what what that's about, and was it because of the number of all that? What page are? Well, it's on the uh, summary page uh, under. Board services, school, uh, school administration, 25.7% increase. Is that because program All right, let me, let me maybe take a shot at it. So I think what, what we're looking at is page 13. Page 13. Oh. You, you're looking at, so, so really, you look at the things that stand out in this budget. We talked about this in our last meeting. So you see a glaring 25.7% increase, right. right? So, you know, the way I understand that, we talked about that at our last meeting. Is there's certain costs that we pay uh, for being part of the WCSU for administrative costs. And because of the number of students we have in Leland Gray, vice the number of students in the elementary schools, and ours being at a higher ratio, there's more cost associated with that. In addition to that, the director of uh, technology position was supplied by two federal grants that were available before to offset that cost. Those federal grants are not available in this budget. So with that extra cost, that's absorbed into that 25%. So Duran or Steve, I don't know if any more to add to that, okay. but that's how I understand that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do with the program that got moved from the uh, grade to the district, like all kinds of that's not included in that. I don't believe we moved any that's new programs this year. I, 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 I'm having trouble hearing. Yeah, you have to speak up out in the audience. We do have a mic that uh, Ralph can pass around, but yep. uh, 
because that is correct that alt ed or home hands on minds engaged program has moved to special education um, which has allowed for a reduction in technical education uh, in, that, in that department and uh, instead it has a 57% reimbursement rate as a special education program so the majority of the students in the program were eligible for special education so the program itself has not changed other than we have allowed 7th graders to attend as well so when you see the increase, you see it under special ed in the middle of that same page, um, where it says special education, the increase is 10.7%. That's where the tech is now. Thank you. I, I, maybe if I can mention also that given that that entire program, which is a full-time faculty member and two or three paraeducators, the reason why it's, the increase is not higher is because a special education the special education department uh, had a reduction in force for next year. Nothing to do with all dead or home, but the total number of special educators was reduced by one. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yes. I've got a question just about how um, to figure out the tax rate given all the different towns. Just sort of thinking about like the common level of appraisal, how does that figure with all the different towns like coming up with the tax rate? I assume every, because every town has its own CLA. Sure, I, I can answer that for you. Um, so at the, at the district level, because as you are observing, um, the Wyndham CLA is 95% and it's much different in Townsend and uh, uh, Brookline, Newfane and, and Jamaica. There is no adjustment at the district level, um, but what the statutes uh, require is that the, the tax rate of the high school be allocated to each district proportionally uh, based on the average daily membership of attendance here. So once that uh, proportion is allocated, and, and there is a schedule in this book that shows uh, that allocation, uh, once that allocation is made, um, it's combined at the elementary level, so it's on page uh, 15. Um, the pro rata tax rate is uh, combined at the elementary school, uh, so then you have a K-12 cost, and then the CLA is applied to that entire K-12 uh, cost to get to the actual tax rate that is um, sent through the select board and the town treasurer ultimately to the to the voters. So what you're saying is that in each individual town, the CLA would be applied to uniquely. The rate yes. And okay. Uniquely, and it's essentially so for Wyndham's share of Leland and Gray, it's it's brought in, and you will see that in your town report, uh, the proportion of uh, on page 15. So for example, in Wyndham. Um, without a CLA in adjustment, we have a tax rate proposed of a dollar seven two um, eight seven. You see that on line uh, twenty. Yes. Okay, so that's that's the Union High School proposal, and then you have the the, the five towns below that, of which ninety two cents is associated with Wyndham, and and what that is is the ratio of students as a total of all students uh, at Leland and Gray um, uh, times, the, um, times the total tax rate, that piece is brought in and combined with the Wyndham Elementary K-6 tax rate, and that's what um, is, is us, you know, uh, equalized through the common level of appraisal. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yes. Well, if I just follow up, so many of you may have read the article in the paper about uh, Leland Gray's budget, and just to you illustrate the question here, because it, this article ends with information that is in fact listed on page 15 
as the sense, uh, you know, he's, he's quoted here in the paper, for example, Wyndham goes from 80 uh, cents to 92 cents. And that's the numbers that you see right there in columns uh, FY14, FY15, underneath that uh, dollar 72 that Frank spoke to. Well, in fact, that that information isn't incorrect, but it isn't really what people are going to pay. It isn't what happens. Uh, it's just how it's apportioned out to the, uh, to the to the each town member town of the Union School District, and then, as Frank says, it's adjusted combined with the uh, the pre K six uh, to uh, and then uh, applied uh, by CLA to it, and you end up quite a different place in each town. And if you got together and compared, you'd see there's quite a difference in the tax impact uh, across the member uh, towns. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Again, on page 13, under uh, expenditures, the first subtotal for our instruction, it shows a decrease of 89,000. How is that proportion between resource materials for the classroom and personnel? So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So on um, uh, this, this goes back to Art's point earlier, um, where uh, you see alternative education going going from uh, 118 thousand to zero, uh, and and that that really accounts for the the. You know, the majority of the decline, or act more than the, the, the decline. Um, so, so uh, as, as Duran was saying, that program is, has been eligible for uh, uh, special education um, reimbursement, and it's, it's essentially still intact, but it is now reported under special education, and that 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 accounts for most of the hundred twenty-seven thousand dollar increase. So. If, if you were looking at apples to apples in terms of uh, comparison, it's, it's really the, the subtotal that includes both uh, instruction and um, the special ed co-curricular and career center, which is essentially uh, uh, up 38,000 or, or less than 1%. So the, the, to answer your question, there is, there is no apportionment. It's 100% moved into special ed, and it's essentially the same, the same program. It's, it's, it's just that uh, now those those students are eligible for uh, the program costs are eligible for reimbursement. I might not have been listening, but did that include the technical ed piece too? It's reduced by a third. Uh, related to it, the technical education is uh, is a, um, a a different curriculum that is being uh, addressed and. Uh, Doreen, would you like to speak to the STEM program and, yep, sure. and the way in which that's... Yep, yep. So the, there are actually two reductions in technical education. One is that there's two reductions in technical education. One uh, is, a, is a teacher who teaches one block a day who had, was a little bit more than a third, and but he requested that it go to a third. So it's, point, it's something like 0.38 to 0.3. 0.38 position to 0.33, so it's just a tiny change. The larger change is a 0.25 position in technical education, which is being replaced by members of the science department teaching a STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, which still has a considerable hands-on component, and with the space uh, opened up in the uh, tech ed classroom, they can do more technology-based projects right in the shop setting. Uh, it's much more in keeping with the uh, uh, contemporary approach to uh, technical education, which has um, greater career and college um, application than the traditional tech education, tech, technical education. And so, the, and we already have the science staff teaching STEM programs in the middle school, because it's specifically for middle school. It's not a reduction in high school. Uh, it's a nine-week. Uh, program that seventh graders and eighth graders participate in, and we have been concurrently running the STEM program for seventh and eighth graders. But because of the master schedule, we can't get all the students into those courses. But the only way we could is to guarantee that the students would have the, the the STEM courses, which includes a computer component, because otherwise they didn't have any kind of um, it's just a required computer component, which is also necessary. Uh, so that's why we made the decision to replace one with the other. 
So we also have struggled in finding a certified uh, teacher in technical education. Uh, we advertised the position last year and were unable to get applicants, so maybe I shouldn't say this to the public like this, but, but the current person who's teaching it is not certified in technical education, and uh, so that also led us to that decision. So it would be the same number of class hours, just a different place? Oh, yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a, a broader question, and if it isn't appropriate to the meeting, just tell me. You'll tell me later. Um, on page 11, we see the Leland Gray enrollment forecast, and I'm wondering, all right, how does the budget you're asking us to approve relate to the forecast that shows continuing lower enrollment? And let me just say, I'm a total supporter of public education. But I just, help me understand. It, it, it's a, you know, it's a great question. Uh, we are, we've been looking at this kind of a budget, I mean, this kind of enrollment decrease for quite a long time. We never really know for sure what our enrollment's gonna look like, but, um, if you look at these the enrollment numbers, you know, they are going down. It's not huge numbers of students, though. I mean, you know, it's a graph and it shows, you know, a reduction in the number of students. It's not typical that um, when you reduce your enrollment by five or ten kids, you can reduce staff or, or in programs, you know. So um, this budget, that's what, I guess that's what I was trying to get at in the beginning when I was saying we, we are trying to... Um, figure out a way to provide the, an education for the increasing needs of our kids. You just heard Dorin speak about STEM, you know, and, and that is just one of so many other needs that are out there for our kids. What we're trying to do is continue to support our kids' education with all these increased needs, but still um, keep the costs at a, a minimum as possible. If we do not continue to provide programs, we will not. We will see a much larger decrease, I think, in, in our enrollment. Right now, we are lucky enough to have students that want to come to Leland and Gray because we do offer good programs, and that is helping us a lot. And we'd like to see that continue. It's also just absolutely critical and necessary that we do provide, like I, I spoke to about before, a world-class education for our kids. Um, they are leaving Leland and Gray, and they need to be prepared for the next um, step in their lives, whether it's on to further ed or not. And we talk about this all the time at every level. We talk about it at our own Leland and Gray board meetings. We, we beat ourselves up over it. It, it. it costs money to educate kids, but it's our responsibility. So, and If I could add yeah, something okay. to it, too. So, you know, that's a great question because we have made it, and that's the thing, on, I think, on everybody's mind how to do things efficiently because we know it's going to get harder uh, going down the road. One, one other example, a small example, how can we save money? So you'll see it in the, in the report, but in the, in the past, uh, we went through New England, the Associate of Secondary Schools and Colleges. We had them come in. We spent $20,000 for them to look at our programs and give us advice. We had quite a few meetings. We talked about that. Everybody said that's what we've always done. We reached out to other schools. We talked to other schools that were facing the same uh, struggles with money, and we looked at what they had told us, uh, uh, what we got out of that in the past. And as a board, we decided that what we were paying and what we got out of it was what didn't make sense. So instead, we allocated a smaller amount of money to work with other schools, try and do the same things. We got to find ways to improve. We're not going to just give twenty thousand dollars to an organization that wasn't giving us an output. So I, I think there's things like that that we got to keep doing. We got to be more efficient with our money, use it for the right things. So that's that's another small piece. And Matt, um, along the lines of offering uh, uh, amazing <coughs> education for our children, we're experiencing quite a bit of um, competition for our choice towns, and so if we're going to, and that's going to make perhaps make these numbers, these decreases, not so significant, and they tuition in, and that's money we need to continue our, our, our
place as a wonderful education. And um, it's in, there's one private school that can afford, they have endowments, they can afford to bring buses into these towns and bus kids. And so it's really important that we keep our, 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 our school as, as a really viable place for all children, for the, the, the gifted and everybody. Yes. I'd like to take the bigger picture in response to your question. Uh, you know, my, my administration throughout the uh, as do all the principals are aware of the statewide trend of declining enrollment. You've heard about this in the news. Uh, this is something that we can't ignore. Uh, we really have to try to uh, orchestrate the, uh, the attrition, the natural reti the retirement of, uh, of staff. Uh, and uh, try to make sure that we have a smooth transition to uh, new ways of providing education with uh, uh, you know, what some people think is a really bad idea, larger class sizes. And uh, you know, that's, that's a public debate because you're represented by the boards in terms of making decisions like that, of, of basically reducing force in the long range future. But uh, this is something that's a problem statewide. I know that the recent uh, Re Regional Education District Study Committee uh, that was talking about trying to uh, uh, combine uh, school uh, boards into one, K through pre-K through uh, 12 around the Leland and Gray Towns, involving the Leland and Gray Towns, has put off a decision to bring it to the voters because we want to see what the legislature does. Those of you who are connected with the uh, legislature or follow the Vermont legislature should do so very carefully regarding educational issues. Uh, because uh, I was just at the Senate uh, Ed committee today. Uh, uh, Dr. Rucker communicated uh, by phone and uh, testified at a hearing at, this, at the uh, House Ed committee uh, last week, right, Ed, Ellie, Frank? So uh, there are lots of things going, lots of ideas, and I don't want to speak further about them, but I, I uh, commend you all to, uh, to take an interest and uh, look into these issues and uh, speak with the legislatures about uh, legislators about what solutions you see to the to the issue of maintaining excellence in education in a cost-effective way uh, with uh, declining enrollment. Thank you. Any other follow-up or additional questions? Yes. I just wanted to add, I think that's a really important question <laughs> and it bears a lot of looking at. And I, I, what I'm going to do is really just echo what Stephen said, that as, as this is happening throughout the state, and certainly happening here, to go into these uh, red committees, these larger units, will help to address that problem, I think, very successfully. So that, that was a good question to raise. In fact, our, um, our state I think hasn't reached the bottom. We had thought the enrollment decline in our state was going to reach the bottom, and I think 2015 they said now they've bumped it out to 2016, I think, or maybe even 2017 now. So we're still seeing some decline. Although I think in our, our supervisor union, our enrollments seem to be leveling off at the elementary schools, and some of them are even increasing slightly. So that bodes well for us at Leland Gray. Any other questions? Yes. While we're on students, what is the proportion of middle school students that are tuition, and what is the proportion of 9 to 12 students that are tuition? Um, Frank, I'm not sure about how many numbers, but I don't know the numbers are specifically. I know we do get, we get tuition students in, in this middle school especially because there's no school choice for the middle schoolers. Um, but but we do have school choice for, actually we have statewide school choice, if anybody isn't aware of that, um, for nine through 12. But do you know the portion? He's probably looking it up. Yes, um, so <clears throat> we have, a, as you see on the annual report, we, we uh, indicate the total, so you've probably seen that. Um, didn't memorize the number this year, but it's pretty consistent. Uh, this is page showing 11. Page 11 60, shows the enrollment Yep. You saw that. You saw yeah. that. And up at 61, um, the uh, two, the um, grade level, let's see. I could figure that out, but I don't have it right at my fingertips. Fair enough. And I'd be glad to 
glad to share it with you. Yeah, I, I think it's relatively. Uh, it's 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 a it's a little bit higher at seven and eight because yeah. as Emily was saying, uh, Grafton and Athens come to us through choice, which they pay right. only at the seven and eight level. Um, because once they hit ninth, they go to the Bellis Falls system. So that that does give us a little more student uh, enrollment at seven and eight than nine through twelve. But that law is being revisited as well. The, the law that says if if we have a, a Grafton student who wants to stay 9 to 12, which we have Grafton at Athens, uh, I think uh, more than uh, about 11 students, 9 to 12, they don't pay. And that law is being re revisited. So that would have a significant effect on our budget because we, we do receive more students uh, than we send under the uh, school choice. <coughs> I think we, we uh, actually only send maybe one or two a year, am I right? Um, but we take in about between 12 and 15. Yeah, I was going to say up to 15 in a year. And so. that's not for any tuition exchange. Right. That's, that's part of the high school choice. That includes Roswell. You know, some of the institutions go Roswell. It includes, I mean, when I say the one or two, that includes, I don't know where they're actually going, but could be going to Brattleboro, I'm sure. That's most popular. Among one or two, you know. it's not very many. It's more that they come back after trying out Brattleboro. Right <laughs> yes. The Wadsboro, the towns that are not in that, the Leland right. Bay School District, does Wadsboro pay tuition? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So you got 79. I mean, according to here, your enrollment as of 12 this past December, you have 79 students to the tuition. Out of 361. A large portion of those are, are Wardsboro. Right. That's right. Most of them are Wardsboro students, yeah. Wardsboro sends most of their kids here. They've traditionally sent most of their kids to Leland and Gray. I don't know how many, uh, uh, I don't know the percentage anymore of what they send to Leland and Gray, but it's been traditional that they've sent their children to our school. As a tuition student, um, how, how much do they pay capital um, improvements or something that they don't have to pay? Uh, they, yeah, this, the state um, uh, provides a uh, format for public schools to use when they calculate uh, allowable tuition. And what is excluded is it's a regular ed tuition rate, so special education is excluded and transportation is excluded. Um, and, and pretty much everything else is included unless there's some kind of revenue stream in that subsidizes something. Uh, so we have to remove any federal subsidies. Uh, like uh, if there's a Title I a revenue grant at Leland Gray, which there is, for, uh, for uh, uh, math and uh, reading intervention. Um, so it's, it does include capital improvements, though. But not the public Non-special ed, we, we can build and we do build separately for special education services. Um, but uh, transportation, we, we do not, we're not allowed to build. Although the state also pays about 47% of transportation costs, so there is there is a significant uh, support for that. But one still pay their own transportation. That's right. They yeah. They run a bus. They run a bus. Yeah. They pay for it. Just a question, but I think the optimum enrollment for here was right around, what, 4, 20, or 30? I when think somewhere, I mean, that would have been pretty, good as far as staff, right. students, and facility. Uh, and, about, know, about the year 2000 or so, right, Frank, am I right? About late, late 90s, early 2000s. We had about 420 or so, I think, for max. Yeah. The school's capacity, I think, is 500. Right. right. We're, we're actually, I don't know, we were talking about this at one of our recent board meetings. We are actually about the same enrollment here at Leland and Gray now that we were slightly higher, maybe, than, am I right, slightly higher than we were when Leland and Gray first opened this facility um, That's right. in 1970. Any more questions? Yes, one question. Um, in the Townsend Annual Report, I'm probably making friends at this question. 
for the Townsend Annual Report for the uh, Townsend Elementary, they list salaries. Here, yes, they do salaries, but as departments. I'm interested, I assume the public information, what each teacher is being paid, and the supervisory staff, meaning the superintendent, Frank, principal, yada, yada, yada. That's not listed. I'm sure I'm not the only one that is interested in that, and why is that listed? I'll take it. Uh, it is public information, so you can inquire with my office and I'll be glad to supply it for you. I question what your interest is in it. So uh, taxpayer? Well, no, I'm just saying that general, well, Okay, the reason why it isn't publicly published is because we want to honor the employee as not being compared one to the other by the public. Okay? But it is public information. My contract's public. You can have a copy of it. Okay, so just call my office and I'll be glad to do it. it Frank some, some, well, schools, some schools do do it traditionally, some don't. Yeah. I, I remember we used to actually do it, Bill, you remember in Newfane, we used to do it. Now I don't think it's in our, in our report anymore. It hasn't been. But you know, there's some, some towns that do ask for it. I mean, you know, it's, it's a request sometimes. It, we have a lot of staff, they turn around a lot here. You know, we have a lot more staff than anywhere else. And I, so, I own my own well, company and I right, do the same thing. Right. And, and Stephen's absolutely right. You're welcome to see what anyone makes here. It's public school, public information. I'm just asking a question. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's a fine question. It's fine. Just to clarify, Marlboro does not publish it. Uh, when I was much younger and working at Whitingham, they did publish it. It became quite the uh, topic of uh, uh, gossip, and they decided not to publish any longer. Uh, but it's public information, so please inquire, and I'll be glad to supply it for you. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Considering the declining enrollment graph that we discussed a couple of questions ago on page 11, I'm taking a look at the five-year capital needs statement on page 6, uh, specifically the subtotal for tax assessment fiscal years 14, 15, and 16. I'm seeing a near year-over-year -year doubling on capital expenditures, and considering the board's interest in sensitivity to taxpayers uh, and declining enrollment, I'm wondering why none of those expenditures are stretched out over a period more than three fiscal years. Well, I'll just mention quickly, um, you, you may have seen that article in the paper about the, the Leland and Gray budget. Um, one of the capital expenditures is one of the larger ones, and I think it may be the largest one in here this year, um, is, is the first phase of a, of a kitchen um, upgrade. Uh, I think it was mentioned in the article, but if not, I'll just mention it here. Um, Leland Gray never had a kitchen. Uh, we, it was the first built this school. The room behind us was supposed to be kitchen, and it was supposed to be a stage, and then all that got taken off, and we never were able to have a kitchen in here. We've called together a kitchen to provide food for our kids. The, the issue today is that our kids are in great need, um, and they need to be fed. And we are feeding both breakfast and lunch, and we're feeding actually year-round now. And our facilities do not meet the needs of, of um, feeding our kids. And this is not, it, it's interesting, I was just down in Bernie Sanders' office and Peter Welch's office, I spoke to both of them today. This is not us alone. We, it is everywhere and they are greatly concerned about it because there is um, a threat to the funding. We're not paying for that. There's a lot of federal funds for um, child nutrition programs and they're always on the cutting block. We feel that that's a priority. Our kids won't learn if they're hungry. So we are committed to continuing to um, provide whatever is necessary for food. Um, that being said, there's other things in there. Um, we, we could, you know, put it out farther. But the board made a decision on the capital plan. Some of it is, um, somebody else help me with this because I don't have it in front of me. But um, controls for heating systems and, <coughs> Frank, help me out. Just on page six. Um, it, it's a lot of physical plant maintenance. Uh, all the insulation, right. Re window replacement, keeping the building up. Um, it, it can get stretched. Um, this is a plan. The plan could also change. I mean, you know, um, there were adjustments to this year's bottom line number um, because of the other things we saw impact the budget. So some of the things that we had hoped to do this year aren't, aren't here. Um, and some of the things that we hoped to do in 2016 and 17 
may, may, not, uh, may not materialize. There could be a more pressing need and we'll have to change that. You know, that's really just a, a sort of roadmap. And, and I, I would just say one more thing sort of in general about the capital plan. We are really committed to a capital plan and keeping our facilities up. And it has paid off for us. There's a lot of other schools around the state that have not been able to do that. Um, and they're paying for it now. We, we even have some locally in this part of the state. So we're, you know, we're trying to make sure that we stay ahead of it as much as we can because, as we all know, with our own homes, things need to be taken care of. I, I, I would just add, you, you mentioned the control system, and that right. is that is to um, to maintain the system that was installed in 1992 uh, when we did the wood chip uh, uh, retrofit, and those components are becoming obsolete. Uh, so it's, it's we have been stretching that one out for a long time, and now the, this capital proposal begins uh, levels of uh, replacements. So. Um, the, the other the other thing that's probably uh, gone through its useful life is the uh, uh, on the A level the the insulation uh, uh, has been put off and it, it needs to be um, replaced. So at some point in time, it doesn't matter what the enrollment is. If you're going to operate a building, you know you have to have a, a safe environment and a good learning environment. So it's time to make these investments. I don't want to read passion, but I think we're having a, a, a small issue with the use of some words there. Um, I'm not implying that you're kicking the can down the road or that these projects be put off when I say stretch them out. My question is, we knew the windows were going to need to be replaced. We've known for years that we need a cafeteria, but we're doing a great deal of these things at once. I'm looking at fiscal year 13 on here, and we spent 27,000. My question is a year over year doubling three fiscal years in a row. We're jamming a lot of things. That number down the bottom, that tax assessment, the taxpayers are picking that up three years in a row. We knew we needed to do these things year over year, and we're pushing hard in three fiscal years in a time of declining enrollment and I'm trying to figure out what the long-term plan is. There are plenty of improvements that the building needs, and I'm not asking for any sacrifices on the part of education, but I'm trying to find out what is the strategic plan, because you're making a lot of last minute or cutting tactical decisions on how to present the budget every year, and I'm not seeing a strategic plan represented in this five-year plan. There, well, there's two points to that. One is that, um, while I don't, I agree with you, we're, we're not ever kicking the can down the road because we do remain committed to the building, um, our facilities. Um, but a lot of things have been put off. And every year when the school board is presented with a draft budget, um, there are trade-offs. And even though we are committed to the building, we often, if there's a year when we see some big jump in, for example, like a special ed cost or something, we have to take away somewhere. We try to keep our budget as low as possible. For several years, we actually level funded our budget. <coughs> when, we, when we do that, you know, needs, needs need to be, you know, put off when we do that. Now, um, the thing with the kitchen, that, that thing has grown, that, that issue, we've always known we've needed to inc uh, improve our kitchen facilities. We've actually added it to every bond vote we ever put out to the communities um, and ended up having rejected bond votes and had to remove things from the bond vote. The kitchen kept getting removed. So the point now, it came to us this year that, that the need was just something we couldn't ignore anymore. So while I recognize what you're saying, and I actually agree with you, it's, it's, it's a, a lot to take on, but if we didn't feel like these were things we couldn't put off any longer, we wouldn't be asking for them. In the meantime, we have to try to shave everything we can off of other areas, and that's what our job is, and that's what, why, why this is only a 2.8 instead of a 5% you know, increase or something. We're, we're cutting wherever we can. Can we do better? Maybe. But this is, this is, you know, this is what we think is the best answer to the issues that are facing us with our students. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Anything else? 
to come before the meeting with questions from the public. Yes. I'm just curious, is it not concerning anyone that we have five or six towns where the population is as big as we have, and they have such a small showing to show up at these meetings that where you're attempting to vote a seven million dollar budget? I mean that that concerns me. And I'm just wondering if it ever concerned you or have you ever thought of any way how to make it um, more palatable where more people would attend or maybe more media exposure? I'm not sure. But it concerns me to see very few people. I mean, we have 377 voters in Brooklyn. Right. So I'm sure there's that many in each other town. And to see a small show like this on a fairly good evening um, is a concern. I went to a meeting last year in our it was on a Saturday or something, and again, there were seven or eight people. So it, it just seems that there isn't much participation. And that's sad, because in reality, it's their money, our money, all our money. So I'm just wondering if you have to address these concerns. It's a good question, and uh, I think I just want to set the play can on ask last you year's. Question, sir. Do you think but, that if we were voting on the budget tonight, there would be a larger attendance? I'm sorry. Do you think do you think that uh, if we were actually voting on the budget tonight, there would be a larger attendance? In like a town meeting. Um, no. I can look at what you know when I see turnout in my town for budgets, uh, and they're there for, they're there from nine o'clock in the morning to seven o'clock at night, and the ratio is not much better to be honest with you, unless there's something really being kicked around that's really piqued their, their curiosity. Yeah. It'll, It'll peak up, but for the most part, it stays pretty flat, and the same people come out. And it's difficult because you have people working; they have budgets that they have to be concerned about. And then tomorrow, we're going to vote for a seven million dollar budget in a blizzard or something. Yeah, it's not so it, it just concerns me because I don't think you're getting a true, accurate picture of what everyone's thinking. So, so if I could just give you sort of the history, maybe you're aware of the history of why we're where we are today. Um, we used to vote from the floor um, here, and we had meetings that um, had, had 50, 60 people in them, or less even. And then we had meetings where we had, I think we had one meeting where we had like 600 people here in, in this room. We, of course, didn't have the curtain up. We, we had a packed room. Um, but, but that wasn't very common. Um, to have large turnouts like that. We had some budget annual meetings where we voted from the floor and like that. But there was one year where the school board was petitioned and it was back in 2006 maybe, I think, uh, where this, am I right? Probably 2006? 2005. 2005? Um, where, where we were um, petitioned to change our method of voting to go to an uh, Australian ballot. That was put on our warning. The voters in the communities, the five communities, made the decision to go to this um, method of voting. So right now, we've been doing it ever since. Um, for better or worse, we, we've had the question come to us. Ralph has even brought it to us as a citizen. Um, would the board be interested in turning it back over, putting it on the warning, and asking whether people want to go back to voting from the floor because of that very issue? As each year has gone on, we actually have a better turnout this year than we do in some other years. I mean, honestly, this is, I'm thrilled you're all here. Uh, but, but the reason the board has chosen to not actively put it on by themselves onto the warning was because it was a petition originally from the voters and the taxpayers in the towns that put it there. And we really have felt all along that it should be coming from the citizens in the five towns to, to take it back to the floor vote. So we've kind of taken a step away from it. And, and are letting it um, work out. We do the best we can for advertising, I think. I mean, we, we get it in, in the box ads and the paper. We can't any longer mail these out. We haven't been doing it in quite a long time, but we do get these out as quick as they're published. They're in all the towns and whatever places we can put them. We are mailing to the tune of, what, what does it cost us to mail this? Um, nearly a thousand dollars to mail the summary. So we try to get that out. My apologies for the incorrect date, if anybody knew about the way around. One ad after another, oh, yeah. these things happen. But anyway, um, and when we hold an information meeting, in fact, we were going to ask about that later, we hold an information meeting a week prior, although we're not required by law to do that anymore, because we hold this meeting, and this meets our requirement for an information <coughs> meeting prior to an Australian ballot, but we still feel committed to 
offering at least one other information meeting for communities to come out. We had absolutely no one show up from the five towns at our information meeting last week. Um, I, I'm not sure what the issues. I, I can tell you, I, I agree with you 100%. This is it, it's always concerned us when there's low turnout for anything like this. But we're not alone. Brattleboro, I think, which is a lot okay. bigger budget, they, do they vote that. from the floor and they get very few people showing up for their meetings. Yeah. I, I've seen dwindling numbers happening at the um, New, New Fane in Brookline, the Newbrook meeting, you know, the New Fane Brookline budget meeting. That seems to have gone. They're changing their date from Saturday. That may have been the way you think of it, from Saturday to Wednesday, I think, is it this yes. year? Yes, yeah. 12. Right. So you tell me. <coughs> another, another issue we have is people running for school board. Yeah, we have had a blank spot ever since I've been on the board from Brookline. Nobody's taken in till Wendell. Yeah, and now there's um, a missing one from New Fame. Yeah, and uh, I ran unopposed, which I think is very normal. Well, in fact, um, I just heard a statistic that um, I think it was 89% of all school board members elected last cycle, which uh, was town meeting last March, ran unopposed. Right. In the state of Vermont, I mean. Not just here, in the state. Emily, well, I, I guess I... It would be nice, maybe, to consider some sort of round table or some kind of think tank that what you can do to, to maybe motivate people. Uh, as, as a, you know, in conclusion, I don't know what the answer is, to be honest with you, but there's apparently a problem. I, I just like to throw in too, as we Emily mentioned, we had the information we had right the, last week, and, and we had nobody there, right? I heard some, well, 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 the Thursday <laughs> one, two people did show up, but I'm yeah. saying the one that was oh, yeah. And, and, and we no had offense. some some great questions tonight. We have the great questions on on capital and what we're doing on a strategic plan. We talked about tech ed, and you guys are asking us great questions that we should be thinking of. We've been working on this budget since like November. Early in November, October. October last year, right? So we have had ample board meetings where we've had opportunities for different insight coming from you guys to, to bring to the board meetings and make sure we're looking at the right thing. You know, now it's the day before a vote. We're pretty much here with what we got. We can explain to you how we got here. Can't really do much of it now. We can, we can turn a budget down or we can vote it through. That's where we are. But we don't get the participation at the board meetings that help, helps us make sure we're developing this with the community. So I think we gotta, we got to work on that. You know, I do, I agree. I, I think we do need to work on that. We need to figure out a better way to engage the community. And that's going to be um, the communities, I mean. I, I think of all five towns as our community. And I think we're, that's going to be first on our, our agenda coming up. We do need to address that somehow. And I think we'd see more people at the board meetings, more people at this meeting. And then the turnout, too. I mean, look how many people we had vote on our budget last year. 200, 216 or so. I think the lowest we'd ever had. I mean, well. that, that's, for, like you said, $7 million. In this community, in our communities, where people know what a dollar means around here. So we you need your help. Thank you. Just look on page six, and it will tell last year's district. Did you see that? Okay. We had, for two or three years, we've had this discussion. But then as soon as the meeting's over, nobody, we need, like, one person from the five town member towns to get together and spearhead the petition you know if they if they want to try this and and you know i'm i'm now in favor of trying something else because this isn't i mean we gave australia ballot a pretty good uh shot and we aren't getting uh, you know when you get 200 and some where there's 500 tax dollar voters in just the town of jamaica and we don't even get 200 30 47 so there's you know the you know and i'm not i don't care which way it goes, I just wish, like you say, that we should. I still think that 150 people sitting in this room and hearing what we heard tonight and then voting is more appropriate than somebody going to the polling booth tomorrow and not having a clue whether they're what they really are voting on. They they would vote to win, vote a yes or no. And, but anyway, if if some if we can get somebody something that started right after this and, and go with it, I think we could probably have a summer <coughs> vote. Um, you know. If we get the petition in order, you could, I think the law is you could have a, a, yeah, vote a special, in, yeah, special, special meeting, meeting. Yeah. and then we could actually vote right, you know, at the meeting next year. But yeah. anyway, a good, very good question. Yes, Kit. 
promised myself I'd keep my mouth shut when I bring back on this. I, I think first you have to believe that nobody attended this year's information meeting because of the incorrect dates. If you look back, I think that myself, Arthur, and four or five other people here have attended every informational meeting since I can remember. So to sit there and propose that nobody showed up at the information meeting, try to own that on the day, really. Well, secondarily, and I've said for years, you know, when we talk about budgets and money, and this certainly isn't a new issue that's come up. No. I've been to enough board meetings and information meetings. I think that people in general in all of the towns are feeling so disempowered that they have no empowerment and no voice and no ability to affect what the budget is. Especially considering all of the state mandates and, and things that have to happen in school that we have to fund. I mean, we're, we're really forced to fund a major percentage of this budget. I mean, I think that answers many people that I talk to in the same in, in the town meeting levels. Is people just don't feel empowered enough to affect the budget because of the state mandates and That, that's my perception. I don't know how you're going to change that to people. But I, you know, we've come and argued it time and time and time and again, and I'd love to see people come and debate budgets, because that's what it's about. But there's a lot of disempowerment there because of things that are out of your control, our control, all the way around. But I will say that, that it's kind of shameful in the lack of uh, participation even in the Australian ballot. Um, you know, town checklists are public information, and there are people sitting on your board that didn't bother to vote last year. So then to sit up there and say that people don't vote, but, you know, it's kind of double to you. Yeah, I haven't looked at the, I, I haven't gone and looked at the checklists. I know they're public and you can do it. Um, I'm not going to go looking for tomorrow because I don't want to point fingers no, on this snowstorm. You know, la last year, I, I mean, I hear you about the information meetings, but I will tell you, I think, Lyndall, you were um, at our information meeting last year, one of only two people who were there, and we, we grabbed her and we corralled her because she, was, she told us she was from Brookline. And we said, oh, we're desperate for a Brookline board member. Are you interested in it? Next thing you know, she's on the board, which we're thrilled that happened, but she was one of only two that turned up last year. And, and that's happened quite a number of years. And I will say, just to say it again, I feel really bad about what happened with that um, budget summary that got mailed out. And because of that, um, it, it, we, we did try to make corrections, but because of it, we were here on the 30th as well. And, and you know, it was true, Allison just came from, from Townsend, we had one other. So we, we do have um, people, we did have people show up, but we, so we held the two of them just in case. But, but in all truth, for those two nights when we had information meetings last week, we still only got two people. So, I, you know, I, it's a tough one. It is, and I know it's hard for people to get out. This probably isn't the time to do this, but I was just thinking, you know, I wonder if we did. I know I would love to have lessons on how things are calculated, understanding the, the, the intricacies of budgeting and, and perhaps if there were some classes that people could attend so that they at least understood how it impacts their property taxes and how, and how the budget is developed and what considerations are taken. You know, and then something that would have to be done well before the budget time because at that time we're really busy. But, well, in fact, there are, there are webinars um, yeah. that anybody can sign up for at the state level. They, I think they do them both at the tax department and they do them at Vermont School Boards Association. You can sign up for those. Um, we can hold them here, you know, if people are interested in that, for sure. I, I would say, though, we might want to watch and see what's happening this year because there's an awful lot of conversation going on about ed funding at the state level this year. Um, and we may see some changes happening up there in the legislature this year, so we might want to Hold off explaining it all to you if it's going to change. Yes. So the Jamaica Coffee Shop yesterday picked up my second copy of this, one for my wife, 
and that's the second location. The other was down in uh, at the market in Townsend where I found these out. And at both places, I stopped for a good 15 minutes, surveyed every single person that walked past, asked them when the school board meets, where do they meet? Did they, do they know anything about the budget? Not a single person has a clue where you meet. I shouldn't have to hunt and peck on the internet, on a website, calling representatives, trying to find out where the sausage is made, when the sausage is made. I have no idea well, we where you guys are, are meeting and why this is not, I mean, we're talking about reaching out to the community. We're, we're, it's, where in this document right here is, your, is, is the big prominent location, this is when and where to meet up with us to find out what is going on. I, I think we have our gentleman here to help us with our PR. Our, <laughs> I think he's done an astounding good job. I think we should draft you. Well, on our Leland and Gray website, we, and it's it's kind of easy to find. Um, it tells it, all the meeting minutes, all the agendas are there. They're there before the meeting, so you can come to a meeting informed about what happened at the last meeting. You can. That's how I started to become interested in being on this board because I started reading the minutes online and I saw things that concerned me and I started coming to meetings because I wanted to be there and, and it was too late once it had happened and I was reading about something in the past. But we keep up, I think, with everything right you on know, the Leland and Gray website and we've got our own section there. I, I will, I'll tell you, I've been a school board member for 20 years now and uh, the communication with our communities as far as letting people know is a heck of a lot better than it used to be because <laughs> we have a lot more avenues um, to put it out there. We've never changed our location of our meetings. In fact, even this meeting, we talked about doing it at the Dutton Gym up at the front of the school, and then we said, well, no, it's always traditionally been in the main gym, so let's even keep it here. We haven't changed the dates. We've always met, as long as I've been on the Leland and Gray, the second Tuesday of the month, um, except we used to have uh, two meetings a month, and we, now we reduce it down to one meeting a month. We have always held them in the library since we moved out of the conference room, which was back in 2005 or something. Uh, I, I mean, we warn all of our meetings. They're, they're warned in the paper, and they're warned on the websites, and we announce them in our agendas for each other. I, I mean, I, if there's something else we can do, I hope we'll get told, and we'll do it, whatever it takes. Well, including it in this book, in this booklet would be good. Well, that's the only thing we could do. It's right here. No. Oh, you're saying that regular meetings? Sure. I mean, I, I got to tell you again, this costs us a lot, so we have pared it down. I mean, we combine now the superintendent's report and the principal and the board chair's report into one report, so we have less pages because it costs quite a lot to do these. But well, that's a good idea. We should say we meet on the second okay. Tuesday. Well, we do say it on our website. You know, the, when we meet. We haven't changed our time, 7 o'clock. I hope you all come. If, if I could just mention, anytime I go to a ball game, or I mean, I interact with the, the parent community and some other members of the public at games. Uh, so I've seen many of you uh, at events. These days, I just saw you on television. <laughs> I mean, the public yes. access yeah. TV is getting out there. And people say, oh, you had quite a lively board meeting. Or, I, you know, I saw you were talking about this. People seem to be getting a lot of information. I didn't imagine that people would actually sit for two, yeah, three, you. more That's hours to actually watch the whole proceedings of the board. I mean, sometimes we get a call, oh, I watched the whole thing. You know, I had a question. Um, and then there was a board meeting um, about two months ago where about 30, 45 people came uh, re representing different constituencies because they had an issue and they wanted to air time with you know the, the, the time for comment from the public uh, which lasted probably 45 50 60 minutes uh, where they could share their point of view and the school board and I and Stephen could uh, respond and address it there and then continue to address it after the meeting so I appreciate that venue and I know we're, this is a concern that we don't have enough people here uh, I have never had so many people talk to me about the school board meetings in my six years as administrator as I have had this year, specifically because they're watching it on public access. So we appreciate it. I, I would second that, getting 
15 signatures from the petition this year, I think five out of 15 mentioned that they had seen the meetings on TV. I mean, it doesn't, the problem is it doesn't have a, we, we haven't been getting any particip participation back from those viewers. Like we don't have a, we haven't been getting communication back from them. And like going towards into a 21st century model where maybe we're not all sitting in the same room but we're all communicating with each other, uh, finding ways that we can get the voters to um, give back to us some of their feedback would be yeah. a great helpful thing. We certainly read correspondence, but it's rarely electronic. Um, but maybe that's where also we're going in the future. And that'll be part of our, our discussion, I think. And, and it's true, public ask, people tell me all the time they see our meetings on TV. But you know, you don't have to just have cable. I, mean, I don't have cable, but I still watch them because you can go online and watch all of them. They're posted online. So if you missed one or you don't get cable, you can actually see our meetings online because Broadmoor Community Television does provide that for all of us. So I think it's a great comment. I mean, obviously, we've got some good discussions, so we'll take it back and, you know, sure. try, and, try and come up with some different ways to make it more obvious. Yeah. Well, I, I put out a list there. We have a list of certain talent. And on Saturday, I, had, I asked a few of my polls to be my And it went out and so forth. So I think there's 125 people in that list. <coughs> and yet, you know, I still see that, uh, you know, there is a participation that they can hope for. And I'm not sure what the, the answers are. I'll be honest with you. And I put it out, Mr. Kenta. Pardon me? I sent it out as well. Yeah, so. Brooklyn. So it went twice. Yeah. So let's watch. So communication, I don't think it's an issue. I don't think. Any, any other questions from anyone? <laughs> well, yes. I'd go back to the uh, capital needs, uh, something that uh, occurred to me. As the board, uh, uh, you probably have, um, and I, and wondering if, if you have, if you could share it, have you given a thought, developed estimates as to how, how long into the future it would be at the point that it would become more efficient to replace the facility than to continue um, band-aiding it? Repairing, maintenance, and our, our whole building, our whole facility. Yeah. Well, we haven't had that conversation in an awful long time. <laughs> um, we actually think our facility is in pretty darn good shape, for the most part, because, like I said, we um, do take good care of it because the, the, the community is open. But because the article in the reformer said that we had an aging facility. Well, it is aging. It's Forty, what, two years old or whatever, but we're we're keeping it in good condition. My, I live in a two hundred year old home. My, my home's aging too, <laughs> but I'm not going to get rid of it. I, I, I think you know. Can, I think you miss a point. No, I know, I, and I, I'm saying we are, haven't ever gone there because we are not in need of a new facility right now. Um, if there's a need, I'm sorry. If there's a, you know, if there's a need, we did talk about it quite extensively in the past when we had need for more space and didn't make much sense to, you know, not take a look at that. But I think it was back in, you know, it's been 10 years at least since we've had a look at that. The problem, you know, with a, a school building, especially a high school, middle high school like this, you also need fields, land, you know, it's hard to come across a, a location that's good. You know, hey, Frank, if I could pass that or just add to that, because we were talking about the capital improvements. So we're showing out to 2017, right? I mean, you know, we're spending some money here on important yeah. things. Come 2018, and what do we what do we look like? I mean, based on this, can we, are we getting to where we want to be so that we expect that to uh, you know, tell off? Have we looked at that, you know, long term? We have. Um, and, and we're, we're obviously uh, uh, very mindful of where we came from, which is, as Emily was referring to, in 1996, we, we did the expansion for the science room. Behind that wall was air, and we added two stories that was designed for that in 1970. Um, and, and we're just about to pay off that bond. Um, yeah, we will pay that off, I think, next year. And so as, as those kinds of investments do mature, what they bought has a useful life, and it's just uh, um, prudent uh, to to renew those investments 
you know, 20, 25 years out. That, that is what this represents. Uh, the heating system is, is serviced very well. It continues to service well, but it's time, it, 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 you know, to, to make that re reinvestment and extension. Uh, then also remember we, uh, we did some major renovations in 2007, 2008. We completed a job in, in 2010. And uh, that was to accommodate really a very different program use and an interest in the community to use uh, the Dutton Gym for what it was originally uh, designed for. And that's been very well received. So um, we, we have made major investments over the years, uh, but the ones that we're making now are really looking at those, those original investments that are, that are at or beyond their useful life, and, it, and it's time to uh, to extend uh, that utility, you know, in this case, it's, it's uh, as, as Doreen has mentioned on in the uh, in her rationale. It's also a, a lot more detail on the website uh, at the uh, uh, budget uh, overview. The 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 poverty uh, uh, in our area has increased, and it's and it has a, an effect on uh, the need for providing food. Uh, to families, and uh, fortunately, we're getting some help uh, through the uh, federal um, aid program for that. But to to utilize that and to take advantage of that, we, we have to have facilities that meet uh, basic standards, you know, for uh, food safety. And so, so it, it, those that's the nature of these types of investments. Um, if you go back a little further than you had mentioned. You will see that that uh, we were making a hundred thousand dollar a year investments in in capital. After we did the bond in, in 2007, finished the project, we really tailed tailed those investments off in 2013, uh, 12, 13, 14. But prior to that, you you would have seen not unusual to have 80 to 100 thousand in this portion of the budget. Um, and we we took a break after uh, after the bond vote. Uh, but the bond vote didn't, it didn't address some, some of these uh, improvements that we... I think we did a roof, we did the roof membrane, that was probably the last larger We did. A few years ago. And, and Frank mentioned about poverty, I think it was um, Doreen who shared with me the other day, in the last three, three years, our um, poverty rate has gone from 38% to 48% at Lillian Craig. So it, it's a substantial increase for us. And our, our kids and families are, are feeling the, the pain. Any other questions? Could I have a more detail though about, I mean, because it was characterized that the, the, this work is Band-Aid on the, on the building. And the kitchen, it's, it's the food service, I mean, when we were uh, informed about the need, um, it struck me that since I was born, 45 years ago, there has not really been any money put towards the kitchen for students at the school. It's been taken out of the budget, it's been cut. This is the first time. This isn't, this is not replacing, it's replacing coolers that food service people lent to us and things like that. It's not, there's no, it's not replacing something, it's pretty much new. I mean, in reality. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the Yes. Uh, I don't want this to sound cheeky, but I can't find the budget line item that covers um, the active recruitment of tuition students or community relations. What what line item is covered by by that? What who's who's responsible? Which department is? So we don't it's actively recruiting tuition It's in tuition administration students. and counseling. Yeah. It's in administration and counseling. We have a communications budget. It's also uh, written into our two school counselors' uh, 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 job descriptions, the amount of recruitment they're supposed to do, the visits to Dover and to uh, Marlboro. To Dover and to Marlboro, and we added uh, Wardsboro uh, one um, it became that they were uh, more eligible to uh, other schools. Uh, and uh, so that, that's in there. Another um, piece that's in our um, communications budget is five times a year we print a uh, newsletter, a uh, 
newsletter, and it's something like eight pages. Yeah, here's the most recent edition, and those are delivered to all of our uh, all of our schools, so Dover and um, and Marlboro included, the Choice Towns, Boys Row, and our Union Towns. And there's a you know like a a, a plastic clear uh, display case where they're placed in, uh, so it um, prominent in their main offices. So see, hey, this is what's going on in the I think this has been very effective, uh, as well as extensively on our website. I don't know if you've seen the big makeover that took place about a year and a half ago. Uh, I think we have one of the most attractive websites of schools I've seen, and prominent on there. It's, it's, a, it's this link, students and parents, school choice is, is right on there. Uh, and it's kept updated based on the um, new state regulations, as well as uh, adapting it for um, what uh, our uh, protocol it, protocols are. Uh, so, of course, we, could, we also uh, published a brochure. We had two editions of this. Uh, I don't have a copy of it on me, but you can find it on there. And so all of our recruitment packets have a very uh, uh, attractive brochure that we invested a few thousand dollars in, not just for the design, but the full color publication. We also have recruitment with our sister schools, four of them in China. And part of that is that we have a, what they call a, a two plus one program, where the students were, we set it up at the school outside of Beijing, and there are 10 students from um, Hebei Shang, um, Tang Shan um, Foreign Language School, it's a public school. Um, 10 students will be interviewing in April to come to Leland and Gray next fall. So those are all full tuition paying students, plus their other expenses. Uh, because uh, about a year and a half ago, Leland and Gray uh, received the F1 approval from the uh, federal government to allow uh, foreign uh, tuition paying students to come to Leland and Gray for one year. Now, we have a very um, unfair disadvantage in that private schools are not limited by the number of years tuition paying students from foreign countries can come. So, any private school, uh, Vermont Academy, they can take a student for however many of years that they want to attend, but in, across the United States, the public schools may only take a foreign student who pays tuition for one year. Um, so part of that two plus one program is such that they would study an American curriculum for 10th and 11th grade and spend their senior year at Leland and Gray, which includes um, assistance with college placement, um, um, SAT prep and the other programs that we offer for all Leland and Gray seniors, but it's been very well received. Another problem we face with this is about half of the students who have applied and been accepted from China to Leland and Gray did not receive a visa to attend from our U.S. government. So that has been an, an, another challenge that we face. But there is another recruitment as it, um, we had recruitment in March 2012. I went over there. Uh, we had uh, a teacher, a social studies teacher, who's part, also part of the Journey East program. She went over there a year ago, and now this spring she's going back to interview those students outside of Beijing. So we're doing a lot for recruitment. I, 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 uh, I, I always want to do more. And so a, more ideas welcome. And the other part you asked about was communication. We, we at Lil and Grant on the board, we've talked about it uh, quite a number of times. We've talked about PR. And um, could we engage somebody? I mean, the board doesn't really have the expertise or the time to do it, and we can't really ask for administration. And a lot of schools will hire a PR person, even just part time, to start, you know, putting information out for us. And but, but we've never been able to fund that. We, we've never felt like we could do that. So we we've, we've leaned on our administration and our staff to help us with that, and we do the best we can. We can always improve, so I hope you'll share whatever information you have to help us. Any other questions? You ready for Article 7? Article 7 reads, to transact any other business that may legally come before the meeting. all of you, when we held our information meeting last week, even though, you know, we actually had two of them and the little glitch with the, the thing, but we always have held one 
on the Tuesday prior to this annual meeting. It's been traditional. We've been doing it as long as I've been around. Um, but we aren't required to do it, and people aren't coming to it. So we wanted to ask you, do you want us to continue to do that, or should we um, not bother to hold an annual meeting, just hold this one for the information meeting? So we're just trying to get feedback. And we, we talked about it at our board meeting, and we decided we would just put it out under other business to, to the people who attend. Go ahead. opportunity what, what we do it for is to give a second time if someone can't make it tonight we, we just thought it's always been traditional we have kept doing it um, we're just trying to get the information out it's up to you it's actually just we just wanted feedback we'll, we'll discuss it but Realistically, you could come to any board meeting and ask questions. <laughs> That's true. Yes. I'm just wondering, the idea of coming to a meeting last week and then coming to this one, and I'd only get the same information, is there a point in the budget where I cannot possibly come to you know, just one meeting and listen to and maybe hit a hit the idea that I'm really concerned about. So I'm just wondering, is there a time when you're closer to the end of getting the budget ready that that becomes a real informational so there could be some impact before yeah. it's in writing? Yeah, we Where hold a, we hold an additional meeting actually in budget development time. We I told you we go we went we moved from two meetings a month to one meeting a right. month. But in but in the budget development month, which is November, right, we hold an additional budget information meeting to try to get feedback from the community um, before we actually vote on a budget to propose. Emily, the only other thing what we were just talking about the same same thought as as you were saying, and I don't know if it's something we could discuss, but. If it was possible during that budget process that we said at this meeting we're going to talk about capital, you know, yeah. we're, we're going to talk we about can, capital in this, that. and then and then the people if who really have some real good input for that stuff or yourself yeah. on certain items might say that budget means the one I I'm going to lend you know some value to, and then at the end then we say okay this is the more finalized meeting before we put it to bed, you know, and that well, might be something. The other thing we do do is we put on a, our draft budget um, on the website as soon as the board has had a look at it. We put that on, and Durin does a budget rationale, which also gets put on the website um, for, for community to look at, and then, then they can come again to a, an additional meeting to talk to us. This is all before we vote on the budget itself, so um, that information is there. We typically have to, with some update those because we still are in the process of making changes. Durin had to do an updated budget rationale this year because we made some changes to the budget after we were first one, first draft. In fact, I think we had three drafts this year. Yes, Stephen. So uh, I can review just because you're represented to all different towns. The, 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 the annual cycle of budgeting starts in October, yeah. uh, particularly for Leland and Gray and for uh, in November, early November for uh, Brookline New Fame. Because both of those meetings and votes on the budget by the public happen this tomorrow and a week from tomorrow. So those budgets have to be really voted and approved by the boards in terms of being proposed budgets uh, in December. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you have your other town uh, school districts voting their budgets in January because they have the 30 to 40 days prior to the annual meeting uh, on March, usually a town meeting day. Wardsboro does it Monday before. But uh, so it, it's a timeline that works every year. I mean, it's not going to change in terms of what we have to do for publication, warning, and so forth. So if you keep that in mind, uh, really the season about budget seems awfully far in advance, but it has to be uh, November, December. 
and uh, in your local towns uh, December, January. Anything else on the board of meeting? Just say, I, I mean, I don't know if anybody can, if anybody needs, if anybody knows if anybody needs help to get to the polls, I hope you'll at least let us know. Um, I'm, Gloria, I don't know if you've had many people. I've been trying to tell people, I've been out of town, but I've been trying to tell people. The one, one thing about Australian ballot is you actually can vote absentee. Yeah. So maybe people did get out and vote absentee. We I have was, 38 absentee ballots. We did have 38 in Newfane. That's good. So that's higher than normal, isn't it? I think people were anticipating this storm. Pardon me? Okay. They had three. Well, that's a pretty good percentage for Wyndham, <laughs> I think. So I don't know what, what Townsend is looking like or anything, but to make a Brookline. But if anybody needs any help, it's going to be a tough day. I mean, this happened to us a couple of years ago. What, yeah. two, three years ago now? Three years ago. Three years ago, we had a snowstorm. It was a very low turnout, but we still had, I think, 200 and something people came and voted that year. Um, it's not something we can change. I mean, if we were voting off the floor, we could have all met, you know, and said, like you do sometimes at your town meetings, we could have said, um, we're going to recess the meeting and, and hold it at, at another day. But um, we can't do that with Australian ballot, so the vote's on tomorrow. Sorry, Mother Nature. We need some. If there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this portion of the meeting. And move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. And I'm, now I'm just going to read the warning. I think I'm supposed to read the warning for the Australian ballot. Sure. Right. Right. Um, Warning for the Leland Gray Union High School District number 34, Australian ballot. The legal voters of the Leland and Gray Union High School District number 34, comprising the towns of Brookline, Jamaica, Newfane, Townsend, Wyndham, are hereby notified and warned to meet in the town offices in the town of Brookline, the town offices in the town of Jamaica, the Newbrook Firehouse, Vermont Route 30, in the town of Newfane, and the town hall in the town of Townsend and the town offices in the town of Wyndham, respectively. On Wednesday, February 5th, 2014, to vote by Australian ballot on the following question, beginning at 9 a.m. in Brookline, 10 a.m. in Jamaica, 9 a.m. in Newfane, 9 a.m. in Townsend, and 10 a.m. in Windham. Polls will close in all such towns at 7 p.m. Article 1, shall the Leland Gray Union School District adopt a budget of 6 million 999,318 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the 2014-2015 school year dated at Townsend, Vermont this third day of January in the year 2014. I think that takes care of our legal question. So, thank you all for coming. Thanks for great questions. And uh, thank thanks to the board for attempting to answer every, every and all of you.